today for some reason. Uh, so, uh, who, for who is this their first lightning talk session? Okay, so the way that it works is we had the sign-up board earlier today. They're all scheduled for five-minute talks. We're going to do them in order. Um, the one caveat that I put on that is an exception to that rule, which is exercised one time and one time only, and it is right now. If you're on this board and you'd like to give your talk in one minute and you have no, you, you will not have the benefit of slides, you may do so right now. So is anyone on this board and would like to exercise this exception? Yes. Yeah, I'll Okay, come on up. <laughs> Just cross your name off the list there. I can do one minute. Hey, everybody! Oh, well, this is a little scarier than I thought. I'm gonna need that weed mapper guy. Where is he at? <laughs> weed mapper guy, meet me up in front of the stage. <laughs> okay, so my name is Tim Oliver, work for General Electric. We are doing an awesome, awesome um, program right now. We're creating a PaaS inside. It is Docker-based. We try to make it easier for our guys to develop applications and get them running. So with this pass, they'll only, they'll simply need to come to a portal that we're developing now. They'll come to the portal, they'll select their stacks. That stack will be Node.js or Java or whatever. And then, um, and then you know, they'll, we'll inject the application and the code in there, and that thing will begin running. It's pretty cool. We're doing that in Rails. It's gonna be a Rails, the portal part of that's gonna be in Rails. I was not a big, um, I wasn't a Rails guy. Actually, and I'm learning to be a Rails guy. This is my first Rails conference. And uh, so this is all new to me. I would have chosen Java. But, uh, well, <laughs> because Java is ubiquitous. It's everywhere, right? Everybody knows Java. That's what Java is. Uh, but having been in Rails, I am discovering that you are so efficient with Rails. You can get from an idea to a finished product in Rails. So my simple message today is, if you are on the fence about a new technology, there's no easy time, there's no good time to do it. This is a pretty high profile project and we got a short timeline. My message is just go ahead and jump in and do it. You just gotta just roll up your sleeves, you just gotta embrace the change, you just gotta do it. And it will be okay. And particularly if you're doing it in Rails, you will be that much more efficient. Have a good night. Right, I get to drop the mic, right? Hello guys, I'm Fattahul Alom. I'm from Bangladesh and I'm, uh, I work in a company named Nessa India. So we make, uh, uh, we do software consultancy and basically Rails-based company. So the topic I uh, chosen today is actually uh, exposing the API and uh, in Rails and managing the documentation. So uh, uh, the problem is, uh, so Rails is very friendly about the, uh, uh, about uh, uh, making the UI, uh, HTML, CSS uh, front end, and at the same time, a XML and JSON, uh, uh, JSON output also. So, so for making an API, it's uh, it's actually nothing. Just uh, just just do a line of code, or even not a line of code in um, in, in recent versions. But the problem is, we cannot. So when we <laughs> okay, so when we uh, have to maintain the version of the of the api then then that then that's a problem so so to to do that we actually use the grape gem and that solves the problem of maintaining the versioning of the api and also the all the apis in a in a single uh, single package actually so that solves our problem okay it's am i done okay thanks <laughs> I will be mispronouncing everyone's name as per usual. So when I call your name, and it sounds vaguely like your name, it probably is, in fact, name. And you should come up here. We're gonna have, we have dueling stations, so we'll have one on deck. So the first on deck is cloud.io. Cloud it might be Claudio, I'm not sure. Uh, this particular person's mother 
name them an at sign. So that's, I'm, sa I'm sorry about that. But go ahead, Mr. At. Um, hi, I'm Thomas. Uh, I'm from Scribido, and I want to do a short lightning talk about content management for Rails. Um, usually, Rails is great. I use Rails since 2008, and we build great web great applications with it, and I'm sure you did as well. But usually, what people forget is that besides an application, you also need content on a website. Usually, you do. And usually, content is curated by non technical people, um, non developers, and that requires a content management system. And unfortunately, the content management systems for Rails are very poor. I have some screenshots brought. This is, for example, Alchemy is one of the better ones uh, that looks great from the 2000s, like Windows 95. We got Comfortable Mexican Sofa. Uh, we got Locomotive CMS. We got Refinery CMS. We got Radiant CMS. There are even some API based CMS out there. We don't look any better. Basically, since what Daniel Teidemeyer and Hansen promised us to do uh, when he created Rails because you could do a blog within a few minutes. And even people don't do that today, so they even sometimes switch to WordPress, which is a PSP solution which we all don't want to use. Um, so we basically uh, thought we built a better CMS for Ruby on Rails, and that's what we did. We created Cubito, and I will do the impossible. I will ask for the demo gods to be nice with me and do a two minutes demo of Scurito Live. Uh, obviously, we use Scurito to run Scurito. This is our homepage, so you can, um, this is, we are already in editing mode, so you can navigate on the page as you want to. Um, I go for a blog article about this lovely Ruby conference here, and if I want to edit something, I click on edit, and I have to create a working copy. A working copy is like a branch in Git, so you can have multiple people working at the same content at the same time. So I call it RailsConf. And the beauty of uh, Scribito is that you can, everything is what you see is what you get. So um, when you're in editing mode, you can go here, say hello RailsConf 2016, edit that. But also um, we got so-called widgets on the page, which are page components. You see them when I scroll over them here, and you can do like drag and drop with that stuff and rearrange components on the page um, as you like. Um, you can even say, for example, I insert another widget here. Let's go for two columns. Um, and you go here, and you move that here, and you move that stuff, oops, where is it? Like here. Um, I can also insert another image widget, for example. I can have a picture of RailsConf, do a drag and drop here. It will be automatically uploaded um, to Amazon S3, um, and will be displayed right here um, on the page. Um, so you can easily also click on that get a kind of image browser, can even go in here and do some editing, um, flip that stuff around, kind of this. Um, you can even see how that would actually look on mobile. Um, we even recalculate the images for mobile stuff, so you get a smaller version of these images. You get some SEO stuff where you can, for example, see how that should look like on a Twitter card if you reshare that kind of things and so on. So it's pretty easy to use. Um, and the beauty of it is it's just a gem with a cloud backend, so you basically can integrate it into any Rails app. You just add the gem to the um, gem file. That's it here. And then you can create, for example, a model, which is just a plain Ruby class. So I have a blog post here with, let's say, a headline and some widgets on that. Um, it's all schema-less, so you can never have to run like any migrations on that. It just works. And of course, you have a view for that, where you can use a tag helper, which uh, as soon as you insert that, for example, here to edit the headline, you get all these, like, what you see is what you get, editing method with auto-saving, like in Google Docs or whatever. So it's pretty cool. You can integrate it into like any Rails app. And um, yeah, that's pretty much it about Scurito. If you want to learn more about that, talk to me. Um, the video is we give it out for free for any open source projects, for charities, for nonprofits. So if you have questions about that, approach me. Um, talk to our support. Um, we think it's the best CMS out there for Rails. And that's it. Follow us on Twitter. Welcome. Thanks, Drew, for the time. Cloud.io, you are next. Hi, everybody. I have five minutes to convince you to stop using flash messages in your Rails applications. Can I get a shout out for that? Thank you. OK. Well, what are flash messages? If you don't know what they are, good, because then you don't use it. These are th those small you know, messages right there. I actually went back in the history of Rails, and they have existed since the very first commit in 2005. So they might, you know, maybe they were a good idea back then. But I think they kind of hide a problem because most of the times when we use them, it's like we want to expose that information, but not too much, like just a little bit. And really, 
wh why do that? They're not really, they have several issues and I put some of them here, like they disappear. So if a user doesn't see them right away, they're like, wait, what has just happened? And then, you know, with caching, it's, uh, it's not a big deal. I mean, it can be a big deal. And then now you have, you can have problems with JavaScript. And then sometimes you think, well, they're really minimal. And then designers really love to add a lot of stuff on top, like make them shiny and then yellow and then disappears. So my advice is don't use them. And just to give you an idea of how you can actually skip them, these are some examples of when they are used. For instance, when you use the scaffold generator. So when you create a new member, you know, there is this message there, member was successfully created. Well, in this case, you don't really need it at all because you are displaying the member, so it's kind of clear that it was created. Another example is when you update a user, a member, then there is this flash message where you could have something smarter. For instance, if you just say, you know, last updated a few seconds ago, it's kind of intuitive, and then that information stays with you and the user, you know, um, I think it's better. When you destroy it from the index page, you know, you can also do something better. For instance, if you have a counter and then that helps everybody, then it just goes to one and you don't need the message. And then the very last case, when you destroy uh, a member from the show page, what Rails does now is that it redirects you back to the index page and says the member was destroyed, but it's also confusing. I was on that page and I'm on another one. So I think a better way is to kind of stay in the same page and just say, the user, you know, was destroyed or maybe is no longer active because destroyed is real strong. This is the only part that requires a little bit of coding because by default you would just get a 404 page. It's not a lot of coding. You just add another column. It's kind of like access paranoid or a fake delete where you just change the status to inactive. And then you just change your controllers a little bit so it still displays a page. It just says the user is no longer active. And that's kind of the end of my talk. So it, I think that flash messages is something that we just give for granted because they've always been in flash. It, <laughs> they've always been in Rails and we just use them. But if we think about them, we can actually improve the design just by thinking about them. And in my opinion, the real minimalism is not to just put an information there and just hide it. It's just not use that at all. So if you really want to go all the way, then you can just delete the action dispatch flash middleware from your app. And then, you know, when junior developers join your team and they want to use them, they're just not going to be able to do it. <laughs> Thank you. My hall. All right. The stage is yours. Yes. Hello, I'm Michael Hartle. You may know me as the author of the Ruby on Rails tutorial. Uh, yeah, who, who here? Yeah, I think. All right, I'll take that as a, some of you are ready. Awesome. So I'm here, I'm, I'm here to tell you uh, about what I'm working on right now, which is an outgrowth of the Rails tutorial. Uh, it's motivated in part by a question I, I've gotten frequently, which is uh, whether the Rails tutorial is good for complete beginners. And as uh, those of you who may have tried the Rails tutorial as a complete beginner, you know the answer is not really. It's, it's, it, you can do it, but it's really hard. Uh, so what I'm working on now is a series of tutorials uh, that is designed for complete beginners under the brand Learn Enough to be Dangerous. Uh, and so what I've got so far is three tutorials. Uh, I'm calling them developer fundamentals. Learn enough command line to be dangerous, learn enough text editor to be dangerous, and learn enough git to be dangerous. Uh, the learn enough command line to be dangerous tutorial, which is the first one in the sequence, assumes no prerequisites other than a general knowledge of uh, how to use a computer, like how to launch a web browser and so on. And uh, it doesn't even assume that you know how to use a text editor or even what a command line is. There are six, maybe seven more tutorials in this intro sequence. And in developing this, I've, I've found a new theme uh, for, for what I do, which is, is something I call technical sophistication. Um, this is a combination not just of uh, all of the, um, the specific skills, like text editor and coding and that sort of thing, you know, knowing how to use version control, but also knowing how to click around and look, learn how to use your programs by looking at the menu items, knowing to Google the error message, knowing when it's time to just reboot the darn thing. And so I've, I've been uh, taking that theme, and I've sort of kicked it up a notch. Uh, these tutorials are still available for free online, just like the Rails tutorial. They're available for purchase as eBooks, or and you can also buy videos. Um, but I, I recently introduced a new subscription service under the Learn Enough brand called the Learn Enough Society. 
it is a collegial and extremely dangerous group of people working together to learn technical sophistication. So right now, the, the subscription service includes these first three tutorials, and I want to show you how it works. So this is an example of what you get as a member uh, of the Learn Enough Society. This is a special enhanced online version uh, of the tutorial. It has all the videos. So right now there's about four hours of video, about an hour for the command line video um, series. And it's got integrated progress tracking, so you can see where you left off here. I left off on man pages. So I can click on that, and you can see here's the video for that section. And one of my favorite parts is that here you can scroll down, you can read it, but then there are exercises, and uh, there's an interface for entering the, uh, the answer. So this uh, first, sec the second exercise is uh, how do you use the man page to figure out how to suppress the new line when you use echo. And so I'm going to paste in my answer. And it supports uh, Markdown, and this is GitHub flavored Markdown. Uh, down here you can see it says share, I don't know if you can read it, but it says share with other members. So you can share your answers with other members. And I'm using this interface to write my answers to the questions. So uh, as I go through this, it, it forms a de facto answer key, or at least so we hope. So I can share this here. And you can see it, it's formatted with the syntax highlighting. Uh, so right now we've got these, uh, these three tutorials, so it's a, a relatively modest offering initially, but as you might expect, the full Ruby on Rails tutorial fourth edition upgraded for Rails 5 will be available. It will still be available online for free the way it is now, and you can still buy the, the ebooks and videos, but it will be included for free as, or included as part of the subscription, uh, including all the videos, integrated process, uh, progress tracking. I'm gonna write a bunch of exercises for this new edition, um, and so it's, uh, it's kind of T taking the Rails tutorial and putting it at the end of the sequence so that really anybody um, can, can learn these skills. So one thing to know about the Rails tutorial of fourth edition is that it will be a, a compatibility upgrade with Rails 5. It's, it's still focused on teaching web development with Rails and not Rails per se. Uh, so that means it won't cover things like action cable and so on. But that once, all of the, once I filled in these, uh, these, these prerequisite tutorials, these intro tutorials, I will be making follow-on products, so it, those will also be available as part of the subscription. So I'm, I'm excited to, to see where that goes. If you're interested in learning more about this, about Learn Enough Society and how the Rails tutorial fits in, you can go to learnenough.com slash story and read the Learn Enough story. Uh, finally, I'd like to note that I'm hosting an event tonight, the Rails tutorial beerware night, um, at uh, No Other Pub, which is where Cerner was last night, if you, if you were there. So that starts at seven, right after the, uh, uh, these uh, lighting talks. So I hope to see you there. Please come hang out, maybe buy me beer. <laughs> Thank you. Um, go ahead, Mr. Red. <laughs> Rocket Joe, Ruby's missing batch system. My name is Reed Morrison. I'm the software architect at Clarity Services. I'm gonna tell you all about Rocket Joe. I'm sure many of you have done background job processing, some batch processing. So here's a simple example of doing it the Rails way. We have a job, and we can uh, inherit from a rocket job job, implement your perform method, and we can implement, it can do any behavior that you need. And when we create it, we just do it the regular way we do it for active record model. My job dot create. There you go, there's our job, it's not created. So once you create a job, what if we want to add additional parameters or attributes to that model? So for example, in this scenario, we can do a key, give it a file name, tell us of type string. And now, in our job, we can now access that attribute, just like you can with any active record model. So when we create it, I now add file name, and there's the name of the file that we want to add to it. So again, this is very much the same way you do it today in active record. So basically the Rails way. Validations. Everybody loves validations in active record models. You can ensure that data is up to date and correct. So there we've got the validations, and everything follows the same way, exactly as you do for active record model. So I create my job. I give it some parameters, and then the job runs. So I can look at the state of the job, where it is right now. Then I can do a reload and see what's happened to it since I last checked it. So it started and queued, it was running, the workers are busy processing that work. When it's done, I can say, has it been completed? You can see it's completed, and then I can even get the result of that job. So if I tell it to collect the output, I'll get the output of that result of the job. It's not just send it off and don't know what happened to it. You can constantly monitor it every step of the way. So some batch processing concepts. 
So in this scenario, someone's going to upload a large file, maybe 10,000 lines, maybe a million lines. So what you want to do is, in this scenario, it's the same uh, model, we just include the batch mix in, and now this perform method will be called for each line. So you don't have to worry about trying to process the entire file. And now the batch gets broken up across all your servers. In our production environment, we have over a thousand workers that actually do the number crunching for us. So there's an example of how to, how to kick off this job. We create our CSV job, we upload a file to it, whether it's a CSV file, a zip. If it's a zip file, it'll grab the first file it finds, uploads it for you. If it's an Excel spreadsheet, who wants to deal with an Excel spreadsheet? You just tell it that it's an XLS file, it automatically reads that file in and uploads it into your job. You don't have to worry about where do I store this file, how do I process it. It gets stored directly in RocketJob itself. So once you've saved it, it automatically goes off, it starts processing and will complete it. When it's done, just download the results. The job will hold the output of, all your, uh, of, of everything that ran. So here's another example. Um, where you say in your environment you need PCI compliant, maybe there's HIPAA compliance, you need to encrypt that data, both at rest as well as in flight. So in this scenario, all we do is we say encrypt true, done. That job is now entirely encrypted, both the files, and you can also encrypt your files in and out. And if you want to, you can add compression. Now the rocket job web UI, this is the part everybody wants to see. In the web UI, show me all my running jobs. So you can go in there, click, and see how, what, how many jobs are running right now in the system. Uh, you can add descriptions, you can see the progress. The priority, you can see the priority of every job that's listed. So you can, so you can even change that at runtime. If a job's busy running, your business wants to, to job to, actually, while this job's running, they come along and say, I have another job, make that one the priority. So this one will be paused away, and the other job automatically run. And then once that's finished, this will continue running. It's very much about being business driven, self-service to the business. Queue jobs, show me all the jobs that are sitting in the queue. What's, what's sitting there, what's the priority of each job? How long has it been queued for? Completed jobs, again, we can search through it, it has full search capability. This is all an open source gem. Search is freely available to you, you can use as much as you want. It has all the great UIs, you know, how long the job took to complete and so on. So it's all built in as part of the UI. This again is something we needed, that's why we built it. It's not something we wanted to do, it's something we needed. Scheduled jobs. You can now take all your cron tasks, stick them into rocket job, and it'll take care of them for you. You can even pause a cron a scheduled job. So that's something key that we run into. You see the pause jobs, failed jobs, aborted jobs. You can look at all the worker processes that are out there. What's happening to them, pause, resume. And so if there's any questions, I'll be outside over there. I also have free t-shirts and stickers for anybody that wants, as you got the doors in the middle towards the right. Thank you. A single Lex, you're up. Thank you. Hello, I'm Alex Boster. I work for Appfolio in the San Diego office. Um, so I'm gonna talk about a small project we have called Farsi. It's an automatic style checker. Uh, how many people use Rubicop or something else that uses it? So a lot of you, as I expected, but if you uh, don't know what it is, it's a, um, it's a type of winter or style checker. Um, different languages have different ones. There's Rubicop for Ruby, ESLint for uh, JavaScript, JSX. Um, there's stuff for CSS. There's, there's one for basically every language, you know. Um, so who makes these part of the formal development process at your company or where you work? Not too many, okay. Well, we do. Um, so Rubicop, um, basically, you know, it is the Ruby one. It enforces things like indentation and spacing. Um, just, you know, everything you might put in a, a style guide, uh, a lot of that can be automatically checked and enforced. So, like, how do you decide what to do? Well, there's kind of a philosophy we have that I agree with, which is that um, I think consistency of style amongst your whole team is a lot more important than what particular choices you make. Like, do you care that much if there's a tr always a trailing comma on a list of array items, or is it just better that there always is or always isn't? I would argue the latter. Um, so if you, I recommend you do this, and if you do this, then your team's code will be easier to read and work with, 
It really helps with a learning curve. Uh, I hadn't done too much uh, ES6 or uh, more modern JavaScript until in the last year, and uh, it really helped me come up to speed a lot quicker by just sort of saying, no, you're doing that wrong, do it this way. Um, and I, there's a caveat here for existing projects, do not just run your whole code base through this thing. Things will break, perhaps. So uh, just, we always do it on the deltas, like the commits themselves have to be fixed. And we find it really ties our code together. Um, there are commercial options that do what Farsi does and more, um, like Hound CI, uh, Codacy, which I wasn't aware of, but they're in the exhibit hall, it looks awesome. Uh, Scrutinizer, there's probably more. These do have some minor issues. Um, a lot of them are priced per repo, and uh, you know that can add up, and it's another point of third-party access, so you know, that might be a concern. So we, uh, some of us wrote Farsi. That was not me, I'm not taking credit. Um, uh, what Farsi is, well, Farsi is a form of glanders chiefly affecting, it's a horse disease. Um, don't, don't Google images of the horse disease. Um, so Farsi is open source. Farsi was written by uh, Bryce Bow and Paulus Kautzen, say that 10 times fast, uh, at Appfolio. Um, it is available in a pre-made Docker image for you. Um, it can be run locally. We used to run out of Raspberry Pi that was otherwise make, it made air horn sounds um, for us in the office. Uh, now it's on EC2. It's uh, written in Python, don't tell anybody. Um, uh, so it pulls for new pull requests every 60 seconds. Um, it can run, currently it can run Rubicop ESLint, SCSS lint. It's probably pretty easy to extend for more linters. Um, and it posts violations as comments in GitHub pull requests, uh, and will post a failing or passing a status. So what does that look like? Uh, oops, Farsi complained. It found two errors on my PR. Um, oh, there they are. I, I don't know if you can read those at all, but uh, just minor things. Um, so here we go, and we fix them. Oh, look, all tests have passed. Now I can merge. Um, caveats, it's pretty bare bones. Um, it, you know, one reason I'm giving the talk is that, hey, people contribute, we could probably make it a lot better. Um, configuration's global, but you need one Farsi instance for every repo you're pointing at. Uh, and it uses polling, it would be better to do it like as a callback kind of thing. Um, and uh, right now, you have to change the configuration in, in Farsi, but in the future, you'll be able to just do what most other, like Hound CI does, and it'll actually load the configuration in your project so you don't have to configure it all that. And then there is where to learn more. Hi everybody, uh, my name is Haley Anderson. I am an engineer at Handy in New York City, um, and I'm here to get you all hooked on Rails Camp. Um, so I'm pretty new to Rails Camp. Um, I just discovered it about a month ago. Um, I very last minute decided to just go with them out to the Catskills, um, hence my amazing t-shirt. Um, and I had no idea what to expect, um, but it turns out that Rails Camp is amazing. Um, it's basically like summer camp for adults, um, specifically for developers. Um, you don't necessarily have to do Rails, um, but everyone is pretty much a developer. Um, and it's like summer camp, but without drama, with awesome food, tons of alcohol, um, and a lot of <laughs> super fun activities. Um, and it is very addictive. Um, I thought when I went that it was pretty crazy that there were a bunch of people there from Australia. Um, but here a month later, and I have already signed up to go um, to Idaho um, for the next Rails Camp. Um, it is August 26th through 29th um, in Stanley, Idaho. Um, I don't really know where that is, um, but it doesn't really matter. Um, <laughs> uh, it is out in the woods um, with no phone service and no internet. Um, and you will just be hanging out with a bunch of developers, probably not writing code, um, but you may be able to practice talks or see some. Um, 
We did have a talk on Clojure, a talk on Haskell, I gave a talk on Action Cable, and we had a bunch of other random talks which sort of, you know, excused the going out into the woods uh, to have fun for several days. Um, so you all should come. Uh, this is where Idaho is, apparently. Um, <laughs> And we will be out here. Um, there is going to be a bus uh, going to and from the airport, airport in Boise. Uh, when you get a ticket, everything is included. Um, food, travel, housing, everything. Um, I believe they are looking for uh, more sponsors to actually fund the travel. Um, if anyone would like to make a whole bunch of developers love you, um, doing the sponsorship would be a great idea. Um, and this is where we will be traveling out to. Um, it looks amazing. Uh, and this in particular is the picture that made me decide that I was definitely coming to this. Uh, if you're into photography, this looks like a great opportunity. Uh, also, water sports. Um, there will be a lot of hiking and hanging out in cabins. Uh, swimming, canoeing, sailing, fishing, uh, whitewater rafting. Um, and I also hear that there are apparently no mosquitoes in August in Idaho. Uh, hopefully that is true. Um, it sounds pretty much perfect in every way. Um, and definitely worth uh, coming over from New York or Australia uh, or wherever else you live. Um, it may sound a little bit crazy, but trust me, it is an amazing opportunity. Um, you will meet tons of incredible people. Uh, I met a lot of super cool people who are here. Uh, I have tons of amazing new friends now, um, and I highly recommend you come. Um, you can go to west.railscamp.us. Um, there's a promo code if you consider yourself part of an underrepresented minority. Um, the organizer is Bobby Lee. Um, you can ping her if you have organ like logistics type questions or if you're interested in sponsoring. Um, or if you have other questions, you can feel free to come ask me uh, or lots of other uh, dedicated Rails campers who are here today. Thank you. All right, so I'm here to talk about Gemstash. I'm Mike Barada Stone. Uh, so what exactly is Gemstash? It is a local gem server. It caches gems from rubygems.org, and it caches gems from other gem sources, and it stores your own private gems. Uh, it's also a bundler project, so you can go check it out at github.com slash bundler slash gemstash. And so why might you want to use it? Well, uh, there are over 117,000 distinct gems on rubygems.org with over 650,000 versions. And there have been over 8.3 billion, with a B, downloads. Uh, and downloading all of the gems is about 120 gigabytes, probably more by now. Uh, and I did some calculations over, the, I think, yesterday or so, and there was about 160 gems being downloaded per second. So that's a lot of bandwidth, that's a lot of hosting, that's a lot of storage. So, uh, you know, who pays for all that? Well, for one thing, contribute to Ruby Together if you can, because uh, they help out with that, so that would be awesome. Um, so, well, why not just commit your gems into uh, your repository? Well, so we, do, we have currently do that in our project, and there's about 220 gems and they total about 45 uh, megabytes, and we have accumulated over uh, 1,900 gems total in our in our repository over history, and that weighs in at about 490 megabytes total. And that's every time we clone the repository, we're going to pay that cost, and that sucks. Uh, so, well, nah, I don't want to do that. I don't care. Well, let's just download it every time, right? Uh, so I did some tests for bundling against uh, Rails 4.2.5, 4 and it came out like this. And you can see it was about a minute and 41 seconds. Uh, so, I tried with Gemstash after all these gems were cached, and that came out at 54 seconds. Uh, so then I noticed that uh, Nofagiri 
was taking a lot of time to install, so I was like, okay, well, let me get rid of that just to see what that looks like. And it was 32 seconds now, so that was a big improvement. And with Gemstash, it came down to 11, uh, 11 seconds. Uh, so another reason you might have is um, we, we use a gem called Multimap, and you might notice here that a bunch of the versions were yanked. And we were on this version here. So if we were not storing our gems, then that means we would be in a big surprise if we tried to do some bundling and you know didn't have all our gems there. So you know Gemstash can hold on to these gems and keep them so that you won't uh, lose out on these yanked gems if you if you already had them cached in your Gemstash server. So the way it works is it's uh, if you have all your app servers connecting to the internet and going to uh, RubyGems.org. So instead you would be going to your local Gemstash server, which goes out to the internet and grabs it just once, and then all your application servers would then grab it from there. Um, so how do you use Gemstash? Well, you just set it up and start it. And that's all. Uh, so if you wanna, then you need to start using it, so you can go to your gem file and you know take a look there and just add, require CGI, which you'll see why in a sec, get rid of these change it to your local host uh, Gemstash server, or if you have a remote one, you can do that, and you can CGI escape a remote server to point to that, and Gemstash will work with any uh, remote gem, uh, gem server, so if you're using, say, Sidekick Pro or some other gem that is hosted other than rubygems.org, you could go over there and, and get that source in there, and it'll, it'll, it'll distinct, distinctly separate those so that it'll know where they're coming from and get it from the right server. Um, but even better, you can update Bundler. And Bundler 1.11.2 uh, will support a mirror config. And if you use the mirror config, it will just automatically tell, gem, tell Gemstash where it's getting the gem from and, and just work. So if you have a bunch of gem servers, just set them all up as mirrors and you're good. Also, there is a new index format that's coming that's going to make Bundler a lot faster, and I think it's in use already, potentially, and yes it is, and it's super awesome, and this uh, post right here tells all about it, and it's really awesome. And coming soon-ish to Gemstash, we'll see. I mean, it's definitely coming, but uh, don't know how soon. Uh, also, I'm a guide this year, so shout out to Kareem, who nicknamed me Magic Mike. So. <laughs> uh, and also special thanks to these people who have made gem, helped make Gemstash uh, possible, and also to other people who have tried it out and contributed to it and whatnot. Uh, so yeah, if you want to try it, it's really awesome. I work for OnSite.com and Smells Blue on Twitter and GitHub. And there might be stickers uh, tomorrow after lunch, so uh, just come see me if you want some Gemstash stickers, and if I have them, they're all yours. All right, now for something completely different. I'm here to talk about emotions and how they can affect you as a developer. I'm John Sowers, I'm the CTO and co-founder of Data Simply. I'm the architect at Privia Health, and these are the places you can find me online. Given the fact that most, almost none of us understand emotions, let's see what we can learn if we model our emotional system as an API, see if it helps. Here are the core endpoints. They handle all our basic emotions. But it's not that simple, because there are hundreds, maybe even thousands of aliases that redirect to those endpoints. Things like losing your job, having a baby, like these can cause massive hits on these endpoints. But it's not that simple, because method bodies can be complete, really complex and trigger massive traffic into that core API. And there's some bad news. Any person, event, or situation can call any of these endpoints at any time. How you react is to that feeling is up to you, but it takes work to undo our habitual responses. So first, let's talk about how your feeling server works in general. When that API hit comes in, the download starts, but the server's kind of flaky, and it really can't tell you how big that payload is. So as a feeling's happening to you, it feels like it's really kind of infinite. So when the big feels hit, I'm sure we've had this experience, we feel like if we let this feeling happen, it will never stop. If I express all of this anger, I will never stop yelling. If I express all of this sadness, I will never stop crying. But here's the thing. Experts in my own experience have shown that really feelings can only last about 20 minutes. If you're fully expressing them with like all of your being, they're gonna be gone in 20 minutes or less. 
So how do we do this like feeling it 100% thing? Well, and when, when do we do it? Well, we get to decide because we have a queue. We have got a delayed job system that allows us to choose when and where we process these things so that it's not like in line at Starbucks. <laughs> we can go to a safe place, either alone or with someone we trust, and work on expressing these feelings. But what does that look like? I can give you a few examples, but there's so much more to it. So we'll start with anger, because that's like the easiest one to start with. Toddlers are brilliant at anger. Like they have a fit, they kick, they scream, they fall out on the floor and just do it 100%. Five minutes later, they're fine, they're gonna go play. Like that's what, that's what works. When you're really angry, do that, it's awesome. It's about moving your body and getting like that energy out. So if it's also hard to get started because a lot of us have training to not do that ever. So you can start by saying things like, I feel angry about and like talk about the thing. Even if there's no one there, you say the words that are causing the situation and just talk it out. Fear is the same. It's about physical movement. It's about your body. And even if no one's with you, again, you say the words that describe that feeling that are causing this fear. Like, oh shit, I have to get up on stage and do a talk. <laughs> one thing is for sure. You will feel like a complete idiot when you try and do this the first 10, 50 times, whatever. It's hard to do because we're so good at avoiding feelings. The trick is to start doing those things like before the feeling comes up so they can get it started and then you can sort of let it come. But keep going while you feel stupid and eventually you'll be able to get through it. So why would you do any of this? It's incredibly uncomfortable, it's incredibly hard. Well, unprocessed feelings can make us feel powerless. And feeling powerless can actually affect our thinking. There's a lot of research on this. The opposite is when we're handling our feelings well, when things are in perspective, we can reverse these deficits and their social benefits. If you know your own feelings, you can understand others' feelings. You can choose how your own feelings affect your life and the lives of others. You can choose constructive responses, not habitual ones. So a better developer, what does that mean? Well, if your emotional state isn't affecting your cognition, if you're not distracted by difficult family issues, if you can handle problematic teammates, if you can banish your imposter syndrome, if you can handle hiring, firing, job interviews, giving talks, you will be a better developer and a better teammate. And what do I mean by better human? Well, I mean that you become better at being a human. You're gonna have emotions, you can't avoid it, so why not get better at it? Practice some of these things. When you do, everything will get better. Thanks a lot. I'm just scratching the surface of this. You can find out more at Twitter or my mailing list or just come up and talk to me whenever. I'm also giving the full version of this talk, a 40 minute talk at the Abstractions Conference in Pittsburgh in August. It's a great conference, so you should totally come. That's all. Machu, you're up. All right, we're ready to go. Uh, so, my name is Machu uh, Nilsson. You need to come up with a good mispronunciation of my last name, too, to go with that. Uh, and I want to talk to you about a project I've been working on for a little while called Multi-Zip. And I'm going to tell you about it by way of a story, a couple of stories you might be able to identify with. First is, the first story, um, I use uh, the Zip Ruby gem in my project. I want to load another gem, uh, the Ruby, uh, the user of the Ruby Zip gem. But I had a namespace collision, and that made me sad. Second story is I've created a gem that does something with zip files. Uh, and I don't know if the users of my gem um, are going to be using zip Ruby, Ruby zip, or something else, uh, or whatever. Which one do I choose? That's, uh, you know, when you want a widely distributed gem, that's a hard thing to do. Now, before I go any further, I'm name dropping with the names of those gems. I want to make it clear that uh, zip Ruby, Ruby zip, they're great uh, tools, and this is not a dig and not attack on them. This is just uh, one of the things that uh, Ruby has a side effect over the years, things have happened. So some of the possible issues you can have with like zipping gems, uh, namespace collisions like we just talked about, uh, Ruby version incompatibilities. Maybe the version of the gem you want to use doesn't work with your Ruby, vice versa. Um, operating system compatibility, incompatibilities. Maybe there's just not a, the tool chain available on the OS that you use to build whatever gem you need. Now the thing is, 
is that we've already had in Ruby ways to uh, handle this in the past. We have precedents. We have multi-JSON, multi-XML. You've probably seen these. They abstract uh, JSON and XML parsing backends. And these have been around for a while. The idea works great. And so we now have something called multi-zip. And in the vein of the other two, multi-zip detects what zip file gems are installed on your system, automatically detects the one to use, and then gives you a consistent interface no matter what unzipping gem is used in the background. It supports Ruby zip, of course, uh, archive-zip, which is also one of the more popular ones, zip Ruby, and just for RailsConf pushed yesterday, if it can't find any of these supported gems, there's finally support for using command line zipping unzipping tools if they're found on the system so that you might not even need any gems at all. Although that's very alpha, so don't use it for any sort of close to production stuff right now. Uh, it also supports uh, MRI 187.223, JRuby 1.7 and 1.8 and 1.9 mode, and even Rubinius 2 and JRuby 9 as well. So it's designed to make your code or your gems or whichever as portable as possible without you having to do um, as much work. So how does it actually work in practice? Well, it's pretty easy. You do the normal dance, you install the gem, just as you would, you instantiate it, just as you would, tell you where your file is. Then you can make calls like, oh, show me what's in it. You can see the members of the file. Um, I could uh, extract the member contents into a variable. I, I can then, of course, uh, extract them to the file system too, just like a normal unzipping thing. Um, I could write a member uh, from a variable in case I wanted to dynamically create a zip file on the fly. Uh, I could, of course, remove a member from a zip file. There's lots of other things you can do, but these are the 90% use case that probably we all need to do with the zip files. And so what this lets you do is that uh, you can focus on the, the writing of the actual code versus on the plumbing, versus on uh, what compat what's compatible with what where. And so I've been using this in production for about a year, although its release is fairly limited right now. This is the first public announcement. I invite everybody to try it out and see what works. Uh, give me bug reports, pull requests, support for new zipping backends if you feel like you're up to adding it. Um, I've been using it myself in production, like I say, for a year though, and it's been great for what we do with it. And so, if you want to take a look at it, um, you can uh, go to that shortened URL, and while you're all frantically writing it down, I need to give proper shout outs to the people of Asakasa RB. It's because of them, the inspiration they gave me one night at one of their meetings, that um, I sat down and actually made uh, this gem a reality. And they are the nicest group of people that anyone in the world is ever privileged to meet. And so from me to any of them who are here, I give you a heartfelt omotenashi no anata wa arigato. Thank you. Ada M, you are the you are on the clock. Uh, thank you. Uh, there is a, uh, a we really need to talk about something. Um, but first, my name is Adam Cuppy. Uh, I work for a consultancy called Zeal. Uh, you can find us on the interwebs. Uh, there's a uh, issue that I think really needs to be addressed. I've noticed this is kind of being a concern or a problem over the course of the few days we've been here, and I think it's really important that we address it today. I only have a few minutes to do that. Um, I'll probably submit a, an entire talk regarding this later, um, but I think it's just really important that we talk about this. Um, as we move around the space as a community, it's really important that we address one another with great and deep respect and appreciation. Um, it's, it's not only imperative that we have conversations with one another, but it's imperative that we in fact provide one another with a much better high-fiving situation. This is really quite important to me. Now I know that for many of you, you're unfamiliar with this process, and it's reasonable as to how and so. Oftentimes it might look something similar to this. <laughs> the sort of awkward, sort of fist bump, coordinated sort of, yeah, we're still cool, yeah, you're my bro, sort of thing. Unacceptable in my mind. Or oftentimes you might find yourself in a position where you really feel like you're in fact a friend. That the person next to you is somebody that really cares and is concerned for you but actually doesn't give a shit. <laughs> so we need to address this here today. I've decided that today I'm going to address this concern in front of all of you, all four million of you. Um, I need to call my assistant to the table. His name is Evan. Evan, please, if you would, to the center of the stage. 
Uh, yeah, you. Uh, I'm sorry. By your formal name, Avonicus. First, I'm going to address the how of this. I would like you all to stand up if you don't mind. Find a partner. This is very imperative. Proper distance. It's imperative that you find proper distance. Now, proper distance if you need to know. No, 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 no. Do not jump the gun. Proper distance, if you don't know, is place your hand in a 90 degree angle and place it in front of you. If you can touch properly in bustly manner, you're at proper distance. The first step is you will uh, approach your individual and look them directly in the eyes. The next step that you will follow through with is cock your arm back. Now this is the most important part, ladies and gentlemen. The most important part is focus on the elbow. Focus on the elbow and it shall So from this point forward, ladies and gentlemen, you now know that you have the ability to uh, extend to your brethren, your sister and your other and that uh, you know how to bestow upon them a proper and stellar high five. Now, this here is a wonderful app in which for the rest of the remainder of this contents, uh, conference, you can extend with one another a great stellar high five by putting in your information and bestowing upon them, it will tweet out. I also have stickers. You slap a high five with me and it's yours. Good Fry, you have the stage. Thank you very much. Um, I apologize if I uh, don't get everything right because I just got this uh, slide deck like five minutes ago. Oh my God, made them for me. Um, yes. Okay, today is uh, the day where everyone finds out Godfrey is actually five different people. Um, but, uh, uh, yeah, so, so, um, have you ever asked yourself one of these questions? Let's see what they are. Um, <laughs> what's going on in Rails? Um, I heard they were going to release beta version this month, or RC, I guess, or what exciting are coming up in the new releases, or if you're watching Rails, but, um, you don't know what's happening because there are too many things happening. Well, I have an answer for you. There's a newsletter for that. It's called the Rails, News Rails Weekly Newsletter, or This Week in Rails, um, History. Um, newsletter, uh, apparently I started this newsletter, or one of us, one of the Godfrey's started the newsletter. And um, at the time, I was working for a company called GoodBits, and at, um, we were building a tool for sending newsletter, and um, there was one Friday where we um, launched a beta version of the product, and everyone is super excited, so everyone started a newsletter. I, at the time, I was, um, I guess I'm still a contributor to Rails, so I was like, mm, maybe I should start a newsletter that tells people about what, um, uh, what's happening in Rails. Apparently, that Friday was uh, March the 14th, 2014, so that was quite a while ago. Um, we currently have 5,000, um, getting close to 6,000 subscribers, and we have 99 issues, or um, apparently we'll be sending the 100th issue this week. That's pretty cool. Um, so every Friday, we um, basically have uh, created a um, newsletter of the new commits happening in Rails. Mm, that's probably a slide for that. Um, so benefits. Um, it gives you a weekly recap of what's happening in the Rails world. It tells you about the new features in Rails, um, tells you what bugs get fixed, uh, what get deprecated and removed, um, the new opportunities for contributing, and um, any other interesting things happening from the Rails community. So for example, every week we'll um, highlight all the contributors who made their mark in the Rails repo this week and um, also go through all the, all the new features and stuff. And um, what, uh, apparently Godfrey or the Godfreys want you to help as well. And um, so tomorrow is a Friday, we'll be writing the, the um, Rails conf version of the newsletter tomorrow at 11. So if you want to help or if you're um, writing about these things interest you, you might want to drop by room 2505B. Um, otherwise, you can subscribe to the newsletter at um, railsweekly.ongoodbits.com. Um, and uh, I want to, so here we have four other 
editors here, um, but we're actually, I think we have just over 10 editors now, so I actually very, very rarely get to write these newsletters. So when you get a newsletter that says coming from Godfrey um, in the from header, it's actually from one of these wonderful people. And uh, if again, if you would like to be one of those people, um, you can come tomorrow, room 2505B, and um, please everyone take out a laptop right now and subscribe so we'll get to 6,000 subscribers before the conference, and thank you very much. Uh, next, next up is Justin. You're, you have, you're on the clock. Thank you. It's actually Houston. Houston. Fine. Yeah. Oh. And I got it, I got it. Okay. Cool. It's fine cool, though. Cool, 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 cool. Cool, cool. All right, hello, cool. everybody. Cool. I'm good. Evan would have to clarify or verify, but I think this may be the largest like lightning talks session RailsConf has seen, but I could be wrong. All right, um, I would like to talk to you today about Breakman. Who has used Breakman? Okay, see, that looks like a lot of people, but I've talked to a number of you who said I haven't even heard of it. So um, I'm here to talk about it very briefly. Uh, my name is Justin Collins on the internet. I am President Beef, although I found out um, when I signed up for Snapchat, it was the first time ever someone took my username. So uh, it's the first time that has ever, ever happened to me. But uh, most everywhere else, I am President Beef. Uh, looking at Breakman, I've been working on it almost six years. In that time, there have been 59 contributors, 86 releases as of today, uh, 2.6 million gem downloads, and yet um, still people haven't heard of it and aren't using it, so that's why I'm up here. I want to tell you this is how you use it. It's a pretty complicated process. But um, just to walk you through it a little bit, first you install it, and then you type Breakman, and then the path to your application, and you will get out a report. Uh, it works something like this. Sorry, I changed this last minute. Uh, it works like this, so it scans your code. Uh, that's really all you have to know, and then at the other end, you get security warnings. And it will look something like this which I know you can't read, um, but uh, you'll get something like this by default, and I showed you the default command. Uh, a little bit more useful to look at the HTML report. Uh, you don't have to call it report, but just put .html at the end. And you'll get something like this. If we zoom in a little bit, you can see you get security warnings coming out of it. And if you click on one of them, you can kind of get the context from the code that's around it. There's some other report formats. Uh, if you want JSON, if you want um, CSV, although I don't recommend using that one, um, those are also available. And if anyone ever wants to update, uh, there's a pull request for XML, but uh, it would be nice if it used uh, an XML library that's actually supported. So if anyone wants to take that on. So if you want to learn more, you can follow. Uh, I used to work at Twitter, so you, uh, everything needs a Twitter handle. So you can follow at Breakman or go to breakman.org. If you're interested in the pro version, if you want to go pro, you can go to breakmanpro.com or talk to me later. And again, you can follow me on the internet, President Beef, presidentbeef.com, you know, any, anywhere, President Beef, pretty much. And that's it, thank you. So hi, I'm Nadia, developer and director at Ignition Works, and I'm Saran, founder of Code Newbie, and today we're going to teach you how to book club. So how do we level up as developers? So there's many ways that we can do that, right? We can read source code, we can pair with people, we can go to awesome conferences like this, but a really popular way is to read books. But there's a problem. We all get excited by new books, and we buy a lot, and we stock up our shelves, but... How many Ruby books have you actually finished? Yeah, yeah, lots of guilty groans, yes. 
We get excited about them, we buy them, we read the first chapter, but then they kind of sit there. We never really finish them. And that's a problem that we had too. So RubyConf 2015, November last year in San Antonio. So Ron and I had been in the same talk and we got together and started talking. And we started to realize that we had a few things in common. We both wanted to level up in Ruby. We've been doing it for a couple of years, but we were looking for ways that we could continue to improve our skills. We both loved reading books, both fiction and technical books. And we both didn't have a lot of extra time. So what we decided to do was to start a Ruby book club podcast, which we're gonna tell you about. So the Ruby book club podcast is where we dedicate an hour a week to reading a Ruby book. It doesn't matter how many chapters or how many pages, we just fit it all into that one hour. And then once a week, we'll get together and talk about it and record an episode for you. So, so far we've released five episodes, we've published eight, and we're halfway through Avdi Graham's Confident Ruby. And we've learned a lot. <laughs> So one of the most important things was time boxing, and this was an assumption that we had. I don't know, I think there's a really great blog post by John Rezig who created jQuery who says you should you know, commit at least something every single day to open source. And that is a very hard way for me to, to kind of plan my day, just saying I'm gonna do something every day. What's a lot easier for me is to say I'm gonna do one hour from 12 p.m. to 1 p.m. and do this one thing. So boxing in that reading is really, really helpful. And then there's also this thing of accountability. So when I'm doing my hour of reading each week, I'm very aware that I'm going to be discussing it with Saron later that day or the next day. And so I'm always reading critically. If there's things I don't understand, I think about them, I go back over them, I go and do extra research. And because it's very public, I know that I've also got to do that research to make sure that we're delivering a high quality discussion for you guys to share and listen to. And so when you're learning anything, it usually helps to do it three times. And because it's a book club and it's a podcast, we get that repetition. So the first time in that one hour, we're actually reading. Then we're recording the episode, so we're discussing it. That's two. And then when we go back and actually edit it, we get to re-listen to a lot of the things that we talked about. So we get to really enforce that and build that in. And so we want to share all of these benefits with you. And we'd love for you to join our Ruby book club. So how can you do that? So this month we are, or right now, we are currently reading Confident Ruby. We're about halfway through by Avdi Grimm, who won Ruby Hero, which was awesome. Very proud of him for that. And he actually offered us a promo code. So if you use the promo code CRBOOKCLUB, you'll get 20% off. You can go to confidentruby.com for that. And then once you buy that book, you can actually come and chat with us. So you can subscribe on iTunes or find the podcast wherever you currently listen to your podcasts. Check out rubybookclub.com to find out what we're going to be discussing in the next episode and also to catch up on all old episodes. And also share your thoughts with us on Twitter at Ruby Book Club. Thank you all so much. I really wanted to spend more time with you guys. So I want to tell you about Code Newbie and specifically about building a coding community. So a couple years ago when I decided to first learn to code, I thought I was gonna feel super badass and I thought I was gonna be a superhero and I was gonna solve all the problems and I was gonna feel really good. Uh, and since you're all here, I think you know that, that is not the case. Um, actually felt like crap most of the time, especially as I was learning because there's this huge emotional toll of learning to code that I don't think we talk about too much uh, where you just feel stupid always, you're constantly in a state of failure and if you're not used to that, that's really hard to, to deal with. And when I was learning to code on my own, I used a lot of free and cheap online resources, and it was very, very difficult. And then I went to a boot camp. Went to boot camp for a couple of months, and all of a sudden I had this amazing community of people who understood what I was going through, who felt the pain, who were just as excited, and we would high five when things worked, and we cried when they did not work. But that community for me cost $11,000 and many months without a salary which I'm very fortunate to be able to afford that, but not everyone can. I didn't like that. I didn't like that if you wanted to find people who were excited to learn and wanted to go on that journey with you, you had to kind of go to an expensive, formal type of program. So I wanted to change that. So a little over two years ago, I started the Code Newbie Twitter chat. And it's every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. for one hour, and I would tweet out questions like, what gems are you using if it was Ruby? Uh, what resources are you excited about? Where are you stuck? And it was really an excuse for other people to talk to each other. And we started doing this and I thought maybe it would last a couple months, but clearly it's been a lot longer than that. 
And we've grown into this incredibly diverse and inclusive, and to me, most importantly, a really welcoming community where our job is to help each other learn and to become better coders. And so at this point, we then launched a Code Newbie podcast that we do. We've had 85 episodes so far and counting. We've had um, a lot of really great people just from this community. We've had Marty Hotties, I think on like episode seven. Uh, we've had Sandy Mess. We had a two-parter for her because she's just so freaking amazing. Uh, and so we have new episodes every Monday. We'd love for you all to subscribe. Uh, we also do a Twitter chat. We've done 112 chats so far. I was actually in my hotel room last night just, you know, tweeting away, getting it done. Um, every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern time. And we also started doing in-person meetups. We have them in Atlanta, Austin, DC, Dallas, Philly. We're launching in Minneapolis and Nashville in the next month. And we also have our Code Newbie Slack, which is over 3,000 members. And my favorite part about this is this is a great place for senior developers who want to give back to join and help troubleshoot and debug. So when I tell people about Code Newbie, they ask, well, how did, you, how, how did you do that? How did you build this community? And how can I build my own community? So I'm gonna tell you all my secrets. You guys ready? Yeah? Okay. So number one, it requires rules. I mean this very literally. We have three rules. The rules are to be honest, to be supportive, and to be nice. And we start every single Twitter chat this way. Uh, these are very, very important rules to us. And what I've learned is if you keep these rules up and you start the conversation with that, you invite people who respect those rules and who want to be part of that type of community. So just by stating up front, hey, if you want to be here, you better be nice. It creates this expectation that we're all here to support each other and it attracts really the right kind of people. The second thing is that a community is really about listening. Whenever we do the Twitter chats, I'll go back, I'll read the answers, and I'll try to find patterns. I'll try to find issues that are in the community that maybe I didn't think of before, common questions that are asked, what, is, what are the most popular tweets that were tweeted? And that helps inform me what type of guests to invite and what other things to do. So a lot of, a lot of building a community is really about listening to people's needs. The third thing, and this is one that no one really thinks about, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. My day job is I'm a program manager at Microsoft and I get home about eight o'clock and from 8 p.m. to about 2 a.m. I'm doing something for Code Newbie. All Saturday I'm doing recordings for the podcast. All Sunday I have meetings with the different volunteers. So this takes a huge amount of work. And what I've seen happen is a lot of people get excited about starting communities and doing these, you know, do good projects. And then after a couple weeks, a couple months, the tweets don't happen very much, the newsletter drifts away, you know, they're kind of not around because they realize that it really takes a lot of just straight work. And the last secret is that you don't build a community. You build a space. And this was a realization that I came to, I think in the last couple months, where I said, you know, how do I keep growing the people? But I realized that the people have always been there. There have always been people who are excited about technology, who want to learn, who want to grow, who want to support each other. So my job isn't to build people. My job is to keep making a space and growing that space and making great episodes and having great chats so that more and more people find us and inhabit that space. So if you are interested in Code Newbie and getting involved, or you're interested in building up your own community, you want to talk, I have many more lessons learned. So feel free to reach out to me. You can reach me at saran at codenewbie.org. You can see all the awesome stuff we do at codenewbie.org. Thank you all so much. Hi. I would like to talk about an alternative approach to hiring. And this is close to me because this is part of my personal story to becoming a coder. Um, so my name is Stephanie Nemeth. My Twitter is Stephanie Codes. I am a full stack developer at Space Babies. I live and work in Amsterdam in the Netherlands. I'm a career changer. I was a chemist and now I'm a developer. I've been coding for a year and a half and I've been working as a dev for a year. And you might have noticed that I'm not Dutch. I'm actually from Alabama, but I live and work in Amsterdam. And I would love to tell you another story and that story is about what it's like to change careers and learn to code in a new country, but that would take too long. So if you like that story, you can find me later. I'd love to share it with you. Um, so back to the topic. Um, I work with these two wonderful people in Amsterdam, Joost and Melanie at Space Babies. We are a company of three. And some of you might even know my boss. He's number 98 all time RELS contributor. Um, and he has a different approach to hiring de developers. Not necessary. You don't need a CS degree. You don't need to go to a boot camp. You don't even need dev experience. What you need is enthusiasm, drive, passion, and eager to learn. 
So how does this work? He offers a three month traineeship program. And within that program, I went through this program and my colleague Melanie did before me, a year before me, is we, we start from scratch. We start by doing tutorials, build a clone, Pinterest, Reddit. And then along with that, almost immediately, you start poking around in the production code base and you start doing commits. And it starts with just small manageable tasks um, to get familiar with the code base, like fixing a typo in a view or fixing some CSS. And that gradually introduces you to the code base and builds confidence and helps the intern, like me, to grow skills quite quickly. And the tasks get more difficult as you go on, but they're always manageable. And really quickly, you're starting to build out features and need less and less support from your team. Is it really that simple? Yes, you'd be surprised how much and how fast someone can learn. Yeah, but can I see some proof? Yeah, me, I've ha been happily employed at Space Babies for a year, and my colleague there, Melanie, has been happily employed also for two years. Um, so that's it. I just want to th say thanks. And again, you can find me on Twitter, Stephanie Codes. And if you find me, I have stickers, and I also brought some Dutch stroked waffles. If you want one, find me. Hello. So my name is Jose, actually. So out of the three options, none of them was right. Um, <laughs> Uh, I work at Codacy, uh, we're upstairs, we have a booth, we are an automated code review platform. I'm not here to tell you about that. I am also a magician and a card cheater. Uh, I don't actually play for money, but I do gambling demonstrations for friends, and you are all my friends, so if you want to stop by our booth, I will show you a couple of miracles. But I'm here to tell you about my previous job, um, and one specific problem that we use in interviews. And the problem goes like this. Suppose that you're in a data center, and you're all by yourself, absolutely no connection to the outside world, and uh, there's no way you can reboot the machines, and someone had the brilliant idea of performing chmod minus x on chmod itself. <laughs> now solve it. Now, a disclaimer, first of all, this talk is not about the value of the, the problem for recruitment purposes. This is just a talk about uh, some possible solutions to this. Um, also, all of the solutions have been provided by either myself or my former co-workers, and unless otherwise noted, it has all been tested. So let's get started. If you want to solve this, there's a bunch of programming languages that can do this. Um, here's two of them. And to co come to think of it, uh, nowadays, even JavaScript does this. But here's a solution that doesn't use a, a programming language. Let's say that you create a new file, and you don't have to put anything special on it. It just has to compile. And as soon as it compiles, it gives you an ex executable. It's not going to do anything, but now you can cat chmod onto itself, and you can run it. You can also copy cat to a new file. It has the, the execution bit, and now you can cat chmod onto it as well. You can also just code a little bit of C to make sure that you restore the permissions to chmod and pretty soon you'll be able to run it. Uh, depending on the system, you may have something like BusyBox, for instance, you may run it and it will have a chmod inside. But you probably have tar. So with tar, you can actually create an archive and you can say, state which permissions you, have, you want to uh, give to the file. But if you're doing that, you can actually do it on the fly. And you can without creating a, uh, an archive, you can just change the permissions of another file. So another thing, and this, this one is untested, but it should work, you can create the archive and then you can edit it and find the permissions and change them. A few of the candidates that we had over the years, they said, okay, you said I couldn't go to the internet, but you said nothing about the other machines on the data center. So that means I can open a socket to another machine and I can preserve the permissions of chmod, I can bring it back and untire. What about CPIO? CPIO allows you to manipulate files, and guess what? After the 21st byte, there are three bytes that have the permissions, and you can actually change them to whatever you want. 
So with a little bit of regular expressions and maybe a little bit of shell wizardry, we can do this on the fly. Another thing untested, but this should work as well, I guess. Uh, if you do something to the file that forces the inode into cache, uh, and if you check KCOR for the, the structures, you're probably able to use set to alter it on the fly without the kernel realizing it, and then you should be able to run it once. So it's solved. Now, another concept that I'm very fond of is fighting fire with fire, in this case, fighting an operating system with another operating system. So ideally, I would be able to mount this operating system in a different one, but I can't turn down the machine. Uh, so what I could do instead was, if I could just start an operating system within it, uh, some kind of container, but it, with access to the outside world, it should work, right? So here's the Emacs solution. <laughs> just create a buffer, and with this instruction, you can do it. Unfortunately, I'm not an Emacs guy, I'm actually a Vim guy, and, and I really, really looked for a solution on Vim. I couldn't find one. Um, what I could find was that Vim, of course, allows you to run a command. And this is, after all, RailsConf. So I guess this would be my solution. Thank you very much. And do meet us up upstairs. I'll show you a miracle, or I'll do a demo for you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I uh, hope uh, everyone enjoys the conference so far. Um, so my name is Tian, yeah, uh, that apparently is uh, Chinese spelling, so probably people won't get that, but yeah, it's alright. And I work for uh, uh, Reinteractive, uh, which is a Rails uh, shop in Australia, and today I'm going to uh, present you uh, a project that I've been working uh, on for a while. So uh, it's yet another Rails admin, and it's called Wallaby. And uh, the repo is uh, under GitHub, and it's reinteractive slash Wallaby. And um, I guess, uh, so, uh, for most of the existing Rust uh, admin interface, we uh, normally have a problem that they use DSLs. Uh, and normally DSL is designed to uh, handle uh, issues for one, only one domain. And uh, all the interface that I've been use, uh, using, they they're actually trying to tackle all the things, including the configuration, controllers, uh, view, and all these things, uh, trying to do that using the SL. And that actually kind of uh, brings me back to the old time uh, when I used uh, Dreamweaver to build a PHP page to talk to MySQL database, and you could see that it basically makes up everything in one page. So, uh, or they are not in active development for a while. So that, um, and that actually uh, makes me like uh, try to figure out how to do things when I'm using this uh, interface. And uh, I guess most people will have the same feeling uh, like me, at the end of the day, just want to flip the table. Yeah, uh, because basically you, you need to head into most of the things to get uh, figure out uh, how you can do things. So, uh, like uh, uh, Akira mentioned in his talk, three express, maybe we can wait for something, uh, like maybe we can wait for the existing interface to uh, evolve and uh, maybe we can wait for a better version but I can't wait and uh, so I start to question myself whether we can not learn any DSLs and whether we can use what we are familiar with in Rails maybe the controllers, the views and uh, that's why uh, 
that's how I come with uh, this one, Wallaby. And what you need to do uh, to uh, use it, just to uh, put the gem Wallaby into your rig file, and then to mount it in, uh, in your routes.rb, and then you are set. And actually it has a neat looking and uh, basically you you will have all the common features uh, that a uh, uh, Rust admin interface will provide you, such as the search, uh, simple search, pagination, sorting, form validation. So uh, this is kind of uh, give you some uh, look and feel about about this one. Uh, if I don't have any uh, any time at the end to do a demonstration. So this is a uh, index page and it lists the table and then it has an ID uh, that which is sortable uh, and then the model name is uh, which I uh, use a decorator to come up with. Uh, it actually combines the uh, name and the skill code all together and the text there are the uh, uh, one to many relationship and uh, it will handle that automatically if you specify which column you want to show. And this is the uh, show page. And uh, as you can see, it uh, lists all the, all the columns, including the associations that you have defined in your model. So you have all the uh, pictures, items, orders, category, tags, and even custom uh, relationship when you are trying to say, uh, for example, like uh, some tag or whatever, it will crawl out all the information that you have defined in your model and then try to represent that automatically. And uh, this is the edit page. As you can see, it uh, do the validation for you, although I shouldn't show the uh, flash messages curious talk and yeah I know that is not good so uh, but sometimes it helps and uh, you will have all the like uh, when there is an error on the name can't be blank and then it will highlight it and it uh, basically support many uh, that, that, that's about it that's about it you're, you're a minute over already oh okay all right uh, so that's the look and feel and uh, uh, it supports Rust for device can can can, and it supports all native data types that uh, Active Record supports for Postgres, and uh, yeah, also again. Okay. So it has all these things, and uh, yeah. Okay. And thank you, and please thank give you. it a try. Yeah, sorry. I'd like to sing Let It Go. <laughs> as, a, as a round with everybody in sections, maybe? Uh, let me go. Okay. Um, thanks for letting me go. So, hi, everybody. Hi. It's Thursday, so we're going to do our Thursday hug. Apologies to Mr. Patterson. Um, everyone's going to stand up. No, do your thing. Stand up. Yeah, good job, Eve Diane. All right, I'm going to take a picture of y'all hugging. Right, right. One, two, three, now I'm going to hug. Uh, okay. All right, fantastic. So, uh, my name is Benjamin Fleischer. Uh, I learned that from Ben Ornstein. I think it's fun. Uh, so, here is what we're going to look at. Here you see on the screen a request in the JSON API format. Things to note here. The content type is vnd.api plus JSON. The accept header is vnd.api plus json, and there's some data stuff in there. Uh, this is what a response would look like for a uh, created resource, and this is what a response might look like for a poorly created resource, yes? All right, Stephanie Marks, come on down. All right, I got it. Uh, an important idea here is content negotiation. This is part of HTTP. I've been doing uh, Rails for maybe five years. I've been a programmer for maybe five years. It takes a while sometimes before you get to like the nitty gritty here, but it happened. 
I, I needed to learn what these things mean. Uh, content type is the header that tells you what type, what's the type of data that you're sending. With JSON API, it's not JSON, it's JSON API, so you need to specify the content type if you want Rails to know what you're sending. The accept header says what you get back. I expect to get JSON API data back after when, I'm, when I'm giving you JSON API data. Uh, so how do we handle a request? Well, in action pack, right now, if you try and pass in JSON API, you're gonna get an empty hash. This is an actual test that's in Rails. Uh, so what you need to do is you need to register it. Now notice this is being registered as its own media type as JSON API not as JSON, because it is distinct, it has its own rules. So now Rails knows about JSON API once we've done this, so we need to be able, but now that we know that, that's going through the stack, we need to be able to parse the request into something that Rails can handle. So in order to do that, we need to, and this is, uh, has compatibility for Rails 4 and 5 in here, you basically add the default parser of JSON API with some kind of callable here. The JSON API gem doesn't exist, it might exist in the next few weeks, We'll see, keep in touch. Uh, so this is how we render a response. Uh, in our controller, we're gonna have to create a model that looks like this. Um, we see that if the sandwich is saved, I don't know if you noticed I was creating a sandwich, not with, you know, without sudo also. Um, <laughs> I cracked me up. Uh, uh, or else you're gonna wanna render an error response because the error response is different. I and mean, there's lots of really neat things in JSON API about how it distinguishes between data and errors. For example, the request can only succeed or fail. You can only have data or errors. You can't have data and errors in a response, which is great. Um, now you'll notice in there that I said render JSON API. Uh, I don't know if anyone's ever done that before. It doesn't exist in Rails. You usually use render, uh, render JSON. So what we need to do there is we need to render uh, uh, register a renderer. Uh, this is what it looks like. You say uh, renderers.add, and there's a block. This is basically the same thing that I've done here as the current JSON renderer, except that I swapped out the word JSON for JSON API, just to show you how the integration will work. I actually have open PR in Rails right now to make that even easier. Uh, this, this part of Rails needs work. Everyone's involved, yay. Uh, so that's what it looks like in its entirety. So now we have our request. It'll be processed, we can handle it like this, or like this. Oh, that's what I got because it's lightning talk. This is where I work, swipe sense. We save lives by helping hospitals monitor how people wash their hands. Uh, here's some numbers, they're pretty. Uh, that's me, Benjamin Fleischer. Yay! Yeah. Um, I, ha I have 40 seconds, so I will show you some other stuff I really like. Uh, if you ever, uh, have people saying dry and dry, 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 and it drives you crazy because all they mean is like deleting, like duplicated code. This talk uh, explains why that's a bad idea. It's, uh, dry is like the having the same concept repeated. This is about time. This is about YAML. This is about open source maintain maintainership. Why am I sharing these? Because I like them and I get to do that, right? Uh, this is about inc string encoding. Uh, our spec won't uh, blow up on you. This is some really cool stuff, really deep. Some gems I work on. The, the, uh, Ruby Gems Adoption Center is important, and there's out of time. Uh, so thank you. Bye bye. It's on speaker deck. Thank you. Hi everybody. Hi. Yeah. Okay. Cool. I am Stephanie Marks. I'm a web developer at UL, also known as Underwriters Labs. We're a 122-year-old safety testing and certification company, but that has nothing to do with my talk. This is a talk about GeoCities. Yeah. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So show of hands, show of hands. Can you raise your hand if you were alive in 1996? Oh good, thank you, this will make this a lot easier. And can you raise your hand if you've ever heard of GeoCities? Yes, you are my people, hello. Okay, cool, so there are a few things. This slide isn't gonna work, this slide doesn't work, hold on. Yeah. Much, much better. Okay, so things you need to know about GeoCities, if you haven't heard of it. It was a web hosting service that was founded in 1994. Yahoo acquired it in 1999. At one point, it was the third most visited site on the web with 38 million user built pages. Pretty cool. Shut down in 2009. So, my personal story, putting up my awful garbage looking websites on GeoCities was key to me becoming a web developer and actually getting paid money to make crappy websites. <laughs> 
And this GeoCities era design has a special place in my heart. And I've realized that there are a bunch of lessons we can take from this design style, and I wanted to share them with you. So, first, I wanted to remind you of actual, real, live GeoCities sites. These all come from the one terabyte of kilobit age Tumblr, and they're all grabbed from this huge data grab from GeoCities before it went down. So here's a, one good example. Yeah. <laughs> Under construction, top of the page, cool group. I love it. Here's another one. Rich D's home on the web. There's a hit counter that's broken. Yes. Yes. And one more with Comic Sans. It's got this cute picture of a lion. Adorable. Okay, so you know what I'm talking about now. GeoCities design. Some people call it brutalist web design, <laughs> which is so cool. There's a Tumblr devoted to it. Okay, that's not this talk. Go look at it. So what are those key things about GeoCities design? What can we learn? One, hit counters. <laughs> yeah, okay. So you visit the site, you see the hit counter increment, and before I knew what JavaScript was, I thought this was magic. It was the coolest thing. You see that hit counter, you feel like you're less alone as a user. Someone else looked at this garbage website besides you. <laughs> so we don't do this anymore, I, I don't think we do, but now we use things like a like button or an upvote or tweet this, whatever. But they do the same thing. They make the user feel less alone, more included, like somebody else thought our garbage websites had value. Yeah, okay, next, what's another GeoCities thing? Under construction manners, yes. These showed you that the site wasn't finished, that you shouldn't judge it too harshly, because it was still under construction, man. I mean, look, I got a banner, I got a koala digging a hole, come on. It made it feel like it was okay to be updating your website. As long as you said under construction, you could change it as much as you wanted, to be tweaking it all the time. Yeah, oh, someone's applauding that, okay, cool. Um, I don't know about you, but tweaking my website all the time sounds like constant iteration, it makes me think of agile, it makes me think of when I go on some site and some lovely designer has made some tiny little change, and thanks to under construction banners on GeoCities, I think that that's okay. All right, one more, and I think this is gonna be controversial. Comic Sam. Oh. Yes. Oh, someone's booing, good. Comic Sans, the most hated font of all time. Comic Sans is a casual but legible font that would have made your GeoCities site look friendly, yay, but not too serious. We accomplish this now, mostly not with Comic Sans, but with things like clean and simple fonts that don't have too many serifs, nothing too serious, big hero images of people using the product, friendly looking line art, cute little characters. They make people feel at home, like they're welcome, like this is a safe site to be on, just like Comic Sans did on GeoCities. Whoa, crazy. Fun fact, since I have a few extra seconds, Princeton did a study in 2010 involving presenting students with text and changed the fonts to try to see if they would remember more or less information, they found that if they used Comic Sans or other really ugly fonts, people remembered more information than if they used Arial. <laughs> what? Whoa. I have been and will continue to be Stephanie Marks. My Twitter handle is Sublime March. My website is stephaniemarks.com. Thanks for listening to me talk about crappy websites.